Uh, when we talked a little bit about worship psalms last week, one of the things that we mentioned um, was that uh, worship psalms are, are worship experiences, if you will. Uh, this is oftentimes a description. Uh, these are not necessarily um, psalms that are used as, as a way of worship necessarily. It's more so of a describing a way of worship. Um, so one of the things that is beautiful about worship psalms is it allows for us to see this, this beautiful connection, this, this uh, beautiful connection between the author, the psalmist, as well as uh, with God. And so as we, as we look through um, this, the psalms, help us to remember that, that concept. This is really opening the window for us to, to look into this relationship between the psalmist and, and, the, and the God of, of all creation as a way of worship unto uh, the psalmist. We do that by looking, we looked last week at Psalm 24, a lot of uh, really good passages. We, we mentioned a lot of the, uh, the, re- the repeating uh, nature, especially when you get into um, uh, verses uh, 7 and following. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient of doors. The King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is mighty in battle. Uh, lift up your, your heads, O gates. Lift up the ancient doors, O ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Once again, you get this repeated question, who is the king of glory? This time it's not the description given in verse 8, the Lord is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Now it is the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. We get this beautiful connection, if you will, between different verses. And then we get into Psalm chapter 84. Now Psalm 84 is considered uh, a most excellent example, if you will, of worship psalms. There's a difference of opinion as to the occasion of this specific psalm in its writing. Some say that the author was prevented from going on a pilgrimage and, and, and is thus recalling a previous one with delight. Others say that the author is describing his joy and experienced and, and, and in his experience, excuse me, based on his current visit to the temple. Despite the uncertainty dis, uh, concerning this uh, psalm and its writing, especially its circumstances, uh, the psalm succeeds in describing the particular joy that this pilgrim feels when he visits and worships the temple in Jerusalem as part of the pilgrimage, as part of going and, and uh, being in Jerusalem to worship within the temple. So Psalm 84 is, is this uh, point of view, if you will, this firsthand account uh, of a Jew going to Jerusalem to worship in the temple. So maybe we could see the importance, especially within that context of things, why, is it, why it's important or why it's helpful uh, for us to have something like this is an experience that might not have been recorded. I mean, um, you, you do have experiences recorded of people going to the temple, but not as much in the same way that we see here in Psalm 84. So it's very helpful uh, that we do have this, this psalm. Notice in verses 1 and 2 here, How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts! My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they sing for joy to the living God. The author here longs to arrive or to be at this place where he can worship God. And his desire is not necessarily for the place itself, more so for the experience of being in the presence of the Lord. One of the things that we mentioned when we were talking about our uh, our introduction, if you will, to worship psalms, we mentioned the moments where man encountered God. We look back at the tabernacle now. Here we're looking again at this concept of the temple. And so to be in the presence of the Lord was to be in the temple or to go to the temple as a place of worship. And so you see the description of this excitement within these first two verses of this author's yearning to be in the presence of the Lord. Oh, how lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts, O Lord of hosts? Excuse me. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for the joy to the living God. This deep affection, this deep love that this altar has, specifically for uh, being in the presence of the Lord or being uh, in this place where He can worship the Lord. I wonder if maybe we should have the same heart or the same mindset uh, that this psalmist has in describing his pilgrimage to Jerusalem for worship. Uh, I wonder if we should have the same mindset towards our worship, towards our 
waking up on Sundays and coming and worshiping the Lord. Uh, if, if we all had the same mindset of, uh, of this, of this uh, psalmist, I think that probably we could uh, alleviate some of a lot, a lot of the other issues that we face within our lives if we could have the same heart uh, that this psalmist has. Let's look at verses 3 and 4 here concerning uh, Psalm 84. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you, Selah. Uh, you'll notice uh, something that I've always found interesting is, uh, if you'll notice how often, uh, not just God, but God's people use the example of birds. It happens a lot in Scripture, actually, uh, where we use these examples. But notice, notice this uh, example given in, in verse 84. Uh, the bird also has found a house. So like a bird who has found a house, a place for herself uh, to nest, a place where she can start or establish her family, this uh, bringing forth of her children, laying of her children. Uh, Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, how blessed are those who dwell in your house. So like a bird who builds a nest and brings forth her offspring, so also are you, O Lord, who have built the temple and have brought forth your offspring. He contemplates the joy uh, of those, both great and small, who find safety within these surroundings, like a swallow finds safety within her nest. The bird makes nests in the corners and in cracks, and the atonement, excuse me, and sinners make atonement for their misdeeds upon the altars, each finding a place or a way to, be, uh, or a way to belong as well as a way to be comforted. So in the same concept of how blessed is it for a bird to find a place for them to dwell, so also can sinners find a place of of, uh, forgiveness, a place of mercy, a place of love, a place of of washing away of one's sin, or at least the putting off of one's sin uh, here upon the altar. I think this is a very important um, thing that maybe is easy for us to miss just because we're not under the old law. oftentimes, at least in my mind, I, I think of, when I think of the altars, my immediate thought is to go directly to Jesus, uh, which is, it, it should, because that's a, a type and any type. It's a foreshadowing of fact. Uh, it's a foreshadowing of the fact that Jesus would come and, and remiss their sins. But it's also important that we give significance to the altar itself, uh, because when we look at the, the concept of altars, the altars were a place of relief, at least for a little while. Carrying the burden of sin, um, being uh, sorrowful, like we mentioned a little bit in the um, in the penitent psalms, um, it, we see here this opportunity where where people can find strength and comfort, not just in the presence of God, but also in the in the altar of God, uh, can find be uh, an existence, a, a being, a well being, if you will, uh, find their place within the altar of God. Uh, while also being reminded of the fact that it is continual and has to be done continually, and ultimately that was the need for Christ itself. Uh, the altar was also a very brutal uh, thing. Uh, I, 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 we had a guy who would fill in uh, when I lived down in Florida whenever Dad would travel, um, and I was in high school. And, and one time he did a, 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 a sermon. It's a pretty difficult sermon to listen to because he, he described um, a lot of the practices of the, of the sacrifices. And he went in great detail uh, uh, as far as the numerical amount of sacrifices that had to be offered upon the, off, uh, upon the altar each year because of the, uh, the sins of man. And it, it, just continual bloodshed, just continual uh, sacrificing in order to simply put off these sins. And you know, I don't know if any of you have ever killed an animal but it's not necessarily the most clean of things to do. And it's not necessarily the most uh, polite even things to witness. And so for this to take place at the, at the altar continually would have been a, a, a very shocking reminder uh, to the people of what their sin is really costing um, and, and what their sin is really doing. And I think even a good reminder of those things from time to time would help us to appreciate even more so the... Uh, the sacrifice of Christ, um, that we don't have to do these things, uh, that we don't have to, you know, have farms and raise animals, and then when the first of those animals comes along that's spotless, we take it and then we go kill it. 
um, simply to atone for our sins. Very blessed in that, in, that, uh, in that way. Let's look at verse 6 and 7. There's a few more verses, and then we'll kind of open it up to some comments. So, uh, verses 6 and 7. Well, uh, 5, 6, and 7, excuse me. Uh, How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make uh, it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God. You'll notice here, he thinks about the difficulties of the trip, the difficulties of the pilgrimage to the temple. And he considers them small in comparison to the joy of finally arriving and being in the presence of God. He mentions the Valley of Baca, which is known as the, the Valley of Weeping or the Valley of Tears, uh, which is a, a very dry stretch of land. On the way, there is no water uh, to be found in this valley. This and other obstacles of the journey simply helped him to become stronger the closer that he approached his destination. Believers have a similar experience as they draw near to God. They find strength to overcome the difficulties that eventually seem insignificant when compared to the awaiting joy that is found within the presence of the Lord. And so you, you see in verses 5 through 7, you see this description of this, this troublesome journey. Um, this, uh, this path of, of uh, difficulty. You, you notice, uh, if, you know, if you're taking a trip, especially if you're taking a trip by foot, the last place that you want to walk through is probably a place called the Valley of Weeping <laughs> or the Valley of Tears. Uh, you know, you think about, oh, we go, you know, you take a left at the Walmart and you're going to go six miles to the Valley of Tears. Eh, it's not a very good description. And yet he says this Valley of Tears, this Valley of Weeping, becomes seemingly insignificant. It becomes nothing in comparison to the joy that is experienced uh, when one enters into the presence of the Lord. So with all of its difficulties, uh, however many they, there may be, the joy is found not within the struggle that is uh, in the journey, but is ultimately found, uh, the joy is ultimately found within the destination that is reached when that destination, of course, is in the presence of God. Um, this is, I think, a good, uh, a good description also of life at times. Uh, when you think about um, Valley of, of Tears or Sorrow, that's not necessarily the first thing that comes to my mind, but in the absence of my presence within this world and then my, uh, my actual presence within my heavenly home, the description of that heavenly home is uh, a place of no pain or suffering, no tears, no sorrow. And so at the same time, although we don't call this earth the valley of tears or the valley of weeping, we will finally eventually go to a place where there is no weeping, there is no tears, things of course that are present within this world, pain and suffering. Uh, verse 8 and 9, very important as well. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. The pilgrim now makes his prayer and petition. This is where the device of par parallelism excuse me, uh, helps us to understand the true meaning intended by the author. You'll notice in the first half of uh, 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 verse 9, he asked God to behold, meaning to bless or protect the shield of his people. And in, in the second half of verse 9, he asked God to look upon him, meaning to bless or protect as well, uh, the face of the anointed, the one who God has anointed. This is a reference to the king. He is the shield or the protector of the people and the anointed one by God uh, for this task. In verse 8 and 9, these are both examples of synonymous parallelism, one repeating the address to God and the other repeating the request of God. Therefore, the pilgrim prays for blessing and protection of the king, the Lord's anointed, since it is through his agency that the pilgrim can travel the land and come safely to worship. The king, the anointed one, is a shield, a protector for the people. For example, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 through 12 gives us a, a, a proclamation of the protection that is offered within the Lord. There is one uh, also a parallel, uh, a parallel to the messianic image here. Uh, Jesus, our Messiah, the anointed one, is both our king 
our shield as well as our protector. So you get this, this use of the phrase here uh, in the first half of verse, of verse 9, uh, to behold, that is to bless and protect. And in the second half, you get this to look upon uh, in verse 9, both of which mean the same thing, to protect or to bless. Uh, so the whole concept here, uh, through the use of uh, synonymous parallelism, is to point back to this concept of the protection and the blessing that is offered within the Lord. O Lord of, of hosts, excuse me, O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O Lord, uh, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold, protect us, our shield, O God, and look upon, protect and bless us, the face of your anointed. I think this is a very um, personal aspect, which we see a lot of in the, in the Psalms accounts. Um, we see a lot of, of personal experiences shown forth, and especially within these worship psalms, for the specific purpose of giving us an eye, if you will, into these, into these things. If y'all, if y'all notice, uh, I'm not as uh, moving of my arms when I speak today. We went inner tubing yesterday, and my back is killing me. <laughs> and, uh, it's moments like that that remind me I'm, I'm, I'm getting not as young as I used to be. I used to do that all day, and about 20 minutes of that, I'm like, ooh. Felt that one this morning. Sydney and I both woke up and we're like, who's going to pick up the baby? Uh, <laughs> we're both sore, but, uh, but I'm uh, grateful at least that I can still do that. Um, but you, you get these moments in Scripture where you see these very personalized aspects. You see these very personal moments of, of connection. Um, and I think one thing that, that separates the Psalms more so than any of the books, which we still see these things throughout the other books, but especially in the Psalms throughout any books, is uh, 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 I, I like to think of it especially for David. These things are being written in a way that, that glorifies God or magnifies God, while at the same time also serves as a reminder uh, to, the, to the individual author itself. So you will see things written by the author, not just to an audience, but specifically to himself as, as reminders. And almost like you're reading a, a journal of, of the authors at times. And so this, it, the Psalms have this very personal aspect to them. It's not just a a mentioning of, of one or two things about God, but it is a very personal reminder of things that are significant to them. You know, I'm, I'm often reminded, you know, it's probably the most read at funerals at least is uh, the 23rd Psalm. And you get this very personal reminder of the relationship between David, the author, and God. Why do you see that? Well, because David writes in a very personal way within that Psalm. He writes as the Lord being a shepherd. Why? Because that is the best understanding that David has. Even in his kingship, which is a graduated uh, shepherding, if you will, not just of sheep, but now of people. Uh, even within his kingship, that mind of shepherding uh, is, is still within his heart. It's something that is, is so closely related to his personal experience. And so for David to write in the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. What is he doing? He's taking the thing that he is most familiar with and acquainting that to the God of all creation. Or at least uh, describing the God of all creation in that way. Why? Because he's familiar with it. And so it brings him comfort. He understands the comfort that a shepherd brings a sheep. And therefore he understands also the comfort that God brings to his people. And so what does he write? He writes a phrase like, the Lord is my shepherd. And so for this psalmist in Psalm 84, we see this, this very beautiful connection between strength and comfort that is found within the presence of the Lord at the temple. Within this worship. Uh, to the Lord at the temple. And so as a direct connection to that, you see things described in a way uh, that, that bring forth this beautiful heart, this beautiful mind, into, uh, into, or this beautiful focus of the mind into the front, forefront of his mind as a way of reminding him of this beautiful, this beautiful encounter at the temple. So look at these last, two, uh, the last three verses, and then, we'll, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about that. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in tents of, wic uh, of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing uh, does, he, does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, O Lord of hosts. How blessed is the man who trusts within you. This pilgrim finishes this psalm with praise for the one who is the occupant, if you will, of the temple who is the reason 
for the pilgrimage and the reason behind the joy of the pilgrimage. He is the satisfying ending to this long pilgrimage and brings forth joy as one enters into his presence. He praises God because the Lord is a shield. The Lord is a sun, a light unto his way. The Lord blesses the righteous. The man who trusts in the Lord is truly a happy man. The author completes this psalm by reflecting on why he himself is full of joy. Why is he full of joy? Because he is a man who trusts in God and is reaping the rewards of this trust. Notice that last phrase there, O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts within you. All of the difficulties of the pilgrimage, all of the difficulties of life, all the, the moments of hardship that are experienced when one is outside of the presence of God, finally are, are washed away, finally are removed from one's heart as they enter into the, uh, the presence of God. Notice, notice in verse 10, verse 10 is a very powerful statement here. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather dwell at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I would rather sleep on the doorstep of the temple. I would rather sleep at the, uh, under the canopy, if you will, uh, at the church than to, uh, than to have my own home and dwell in wickedness in that home. A very beautiful moment there. Uh, where this, this author is describing how beautiful it is to be in the presence of the Lord, to have uh, his presence with them at the temple, and as well as also not just describing the beauty of being within his presence, but also the sorrow that is found when one is removed from that, that presence. A day in the courts is better than a thousand outside of the courts. A day in the presence of the Lord is better than a thousand outside. Uh, something, something, uh, something, that's not a word, sorry. Something uh, that I find very beautiful about this description as well is that uh, you, you get this description of uh, one day being better than a thousand uh, outside of the court. While at the same time, you kind of think within your minds, or at least within my mind, I think too, being in the presence of the Lord for eternity. You know, we think about the hardships or the struggles that we face when we are not physically there with the Lord. Uh, in heaven at this moment, yet it is temporary. It is not, uh, the being in the presence of the Lord is not the thing that is, is uh, you know, just 70, 80, 90, 120 years long. It's eternal. Um, it, being in the presence of the Lord is, is the longer extent of the time uh, that we get to be blessed with. And so we experience the hardship of being outside of his presence for a while. But ultimately, we'll be able to experience his presence for eternity. Any thoughts on those uh, 12 verses there in Psalm 84 before we get into Psalm 122? It's a strange psalm. It's not, I would say it's a not much of a commentable psalm <laughs> because it's very descriptive. You know, it's describing one's personal experience. Um, you know, <laughs> when, when I think of stuff like this, the comment that comes to my mind would be something like, well, I'm glad that he made it, or I'm glad, I'm glad that he's able to go into it, because it's just describing. It's, it's not necessarily uh, a, as much thought-provoking as some of the others. It's more of an encouragement of showing. And Psalm 122 is very similar to that. There's another pilgrim song, uh, and this describes the feeling that one has as he comes also into the temple of Jerusalem. Notice similarities here uh, as we go through. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord with our feet standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Here the writer describes both the feeling and the anticipation of joy that he feels when he prepares to travel to and, and when he, of course, finally enters and arrives at the destination of his pilgrimage. I love that, uh, love that phrase, let us go into the house of the Lord. Or excuse me, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Uh, you'll notice also in verses 3 through 5, Jerusalem, uh, that, is, uh, that is built as a city that is compact together to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of the Lord, an ordinance for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for their thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house excuse me, of David. Here the, the author marvels at the meaning, the layout, as well as the history of the city of Jerusalem. He contemplates the beauty of the temple and the significance of the activity going on within that temple. 
the ministry of the priests and, and the offering of sacrifices, etc. His prayer gives thanks for the history and the rulership that has come from this city, beginning with David, and according to God's promise will go on forever. For this man, Jerusalem is the eternal city of God, and he is in awe of it when he finally arrives at the destination of his pilgrimage. For uh, this author, being in the presence of God in the temple, arriving even not just at the temple but also at the city of Jerusalem itself, brings forth great joy because he knows that he is going, going for the specific purpose to enter into the presence of the Lord. Notice as well in verses uh, 6 through 9. Uh, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, make peace within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord or God, our God, excuse me, I will seek your good. He came with the intention specifically of praying and rejoicing before God, but is now moved to offer a blessing upon the city itself. He prays that peace will be over Jerusalem and a blessing will be given to those who love and prosper. He also deepens his own commitment to serve it and by extension a commitment to serve the Lord himself. Here is a man who comes to the temple with a glad heart and is moved by the presence of the Lord, by the presence of God, to rededicate himself, much like coming forward, if you will, that many Christians have done during worship service. Um, he experiences this rededication of self. One overall lesson that we can draw from the psalm is that the impulse to rededicate ourselves um, and our lives to God is one that we should experience when we are in the presence of the Lord and one that all believers have had throughout the years. When we think about this, this correlation between uh, one who comes forward or one who rededicates themselves, uh, this is not a new thing, as is mentioned here. The psalmist describes a rededication of self and commitment unto the Lord as he enters into the presence of the Lord. So also is it the case that we should feel a sense of rededication within our own hearts as we enter into the presence of the Lord. It's not just a yearly pilgrimage. It's not just a moment where you enter the temple once a year and make your sacrifices in Jerusalem. Uh, this is something that can take place for us each week. Uh, the purpose of our worship is not just to exalt the name of God and to build and edify Him, which is the ultimate purpose, but also it serves as a reminder of the God that we serve and our dedication that should be given unto him. Uh, Chris, if you'll go ahead and make your way to the next one, I'll, I'll uh, take some comments right now. Any thoughts on Psalm 122? Once again, it's another descriptive style, but maybe you have something. Psalm 122. Yeah, absolutely. Have holes in the birds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I, I think it's more than a little bit of a parallel. <laughs> I think it's probably very intentional. You know, and that, see, that's the thing that's difficult um, about the Bible at times is when we read something like that. What, what, what does our mind go to? Well, the focus of this is. That, you know, it's this determination of the one who commits in service to the Lord, especially in the physical sense in which they were committing into the Lord, that he does not have a place to call home. Um, if we typically look at those things, we go, okay, that's what it means, and that's what it will always mean. <laughs> and that is what it means, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, uh, we also, because we are so quick to say this is what that means, we also might miss some maybe phrases all the way back in Psalm 84, that could be used as a parallel of saying, okay, maybe this is part of it. Um, you know, what, what was Jesus's, what was part of Jesus's mentioning uh, or preaching as he was on this earth? That it's not about a physical earthly place. It's not about a physical earthly kingdom. It's not about Jerusalem. And so this pilgrimage in, in Psalm 84, the description of this pilgrimage, it describes this, this coming into the presence of the Lord in the temple or describes the, the presence of the Lord within the temple is like, a, is like a bird who has a nest, who calls it home. And then you've got the Son of Man coming a thousand or so years later saying, you know, 
the Son of Man does not have a home like the birds that have nests or the foxes that have holes. Yeah. Yeah. It was a dwelling place. Yeah. Correct. And then once Jesus finally arrives, his intention and his teaching is showing that's no longer the case. This is no longer, upon his death especially, you see the, the presence of the Lord leave the temple. Um, you, you see in that moment where Jesus is ministering, he's saying, okay, it's not about the temple anymore. This was the case. Now it is no longer the case. Um, the dwelling place of the Lord is found within Christ. And uh, his presence is found within his, within his body. And so you get this, this beautiful parallel here. Yeah. I think it's intentional. I don't know. Sometimes I, I, I try not to look into things too deeply, but when they use the same phrases, it makes it hard not to say there must be a connection there somewhere. All right. Y'all ready for the suffering? <laughs> We're going to study about, if this don't put a smile on your face, studying about suffering psalms, I mean, uh, that, might, that might do the trick. Uh, suffering psalms are very unique. Um, when it comes to suffering psalms, uh, there's, there's two main types. There's general suffering psalms, and then there is imprecatory suffering psalms. This word imprecatory we'll get to in just a second. But in our study of songs, uh, we must not lose sight of the fact that these writings are not merely religious poetry divided into various categories, but also are an inspired record of experiences that people had when they had their relationship with God. For example... They contain the questions that arise when a man recognizes that God is present and judging his life. They contain things like the all that one feels when contemplating God's creation and the revelation that it is given through his word. They contain things like the relief felt by those who come before God to acknowledge and repent of their sins and receive forgiveness. They encounter things like the joy of those who have completely given themselves over to the worship of the true and living God. These are times, however, when life is filled with hardships. Excuse me, there are times when life are filled with hardships, calamities, and even death. In times such as these, God wants His people to come to Him in prayer and petition. The suffering psalms were written during such periods and describe the troubles as well as the requests made unto God by those who live uh, and those who have lives that are upended by adversaries and adversities that are faced. Uh, that are common to people in every generation and in every culture. So what do I mean by that? There's a lot of uh, things that we could focus on about the previous psalms. There's the joy of entering into the presence. There's the joy found uh, with it within the wonderful gifts of the Lord. Joy found in repentance. There's a joy found within the creation of all things. But especially um, during times of suffering, one thing God wants us to be reminded of is that there is joy even in times of suffering, that we can be brought to peace uh, even in times of turmoil. So there's these two types of psalms. I, I don't know if I've got a slide for that. Uh, yeah. There we go. Uh, there are two types of psalms, general and imprecatory. Now, general psalms, uh, general suffering psalms, these describe in a very general way the suffering that is common unto mankind. Things like illness, depression, loneliness, and oppression, etc. Some are like wisdom psalms, asking the question of why, but many times... There are different lessons and ideas that overlap but are contained within the same psalm that give this generalized sense of humans, uh, humankind's suffering while on this earth. And then we get imprecatory psalms. Now, imprecatory psalms are probably the weirdest psalms that we have. And you might, if you don't know what the word imprecatory means, you might believe me or agree with me here in just a second. The word imprecatory uh, is, uh, the Latin of this word is to, to pray for, it describes to pray for. So an imprecatory psalm is for the praying for. Now, you'll notice an, impre an, impre an imprecatory psalm that is a suffering psalm means to pray for suffering. Like I said, it's a very weird style of psalm. These are psalms that call on God to either curse or to destroy the enemy who is responsible for sin or the suffering of the writer. This is not merely an expression of pain or suffering that is experienced by the writer. This is a prayer written by the writer that God will come and bring forth suffering and pain 
and ultimately, hopefully, within the eyes of the writer, death. Yeah. Pray for your enemies. <laughs> this is praying for your enemies. Just <laughs> this might be praying towards your enemies, though, not for your enemies. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a wonderful thought for us to have, Mr. Jimmy, because um, there is such a difference. Now, something that's very hard for us to understand, uh, or at least is very hard for me to grasp and then separate from time to time. Just because something is recorded in Scripture does not mean that God authorized that action. Now, that's hard for us to decipher. What is an action that is displeasing in the sight of the Lord but is recorded for history's sake? Or what is an action uh, that is uh, pleasing in the eyes of the Lord and is recorded for the sake of it being pleasing in the eyes of the Lord? We understand this a lot of times pretty blatantly. Uh, when we see things like the sin with David and Bathsheba, did God ever con- condone the sin of David and Bathsheba? No. What, what David did was wrong. That's why there was a need for repentance. That's why we have the repenting psalms of David. But it records it. Why? So that we can see the evil and wickedness of man that occurs even in one who has a deep relationship with God. One who can be drawn away momentarily by his own lust and enticed into doing things that are displeasing in the sight of the Lord, yet can return unto the Lord. And so when we look at imprecatory psalms, this is not simply saying that God has included these things because he wants to watch people suffer. These things are included so that we can see the mindset and the mentality of the one who experiences suffering from someone who is, in their minds, evil and wicked and makes a supplication unto the Lord. And when we think about um, uh, God's solution, especially within the New Testament, for uh, anxieties that we face or for difficulties that we face, um, you, you look at things like casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Okay, what is the word all include troubled times that are experienced when somebody who is in opposition of you causes difficulties or struggles within your life. Uh, And the casting of care uh, allows for that removal of one's own sorrow and the placing of the trust in the Lord. Now the interesting thing about imprecatory psalms, often in imprecatory psalms you'll see phrases uh, that point towards, or sometimes, not often, sometimes you'll see uh, phrases within the Psalms, especially especially within uh, imprecatory Psalms, of this trust. You know, I, I know that you will do these things. I know that you will do these things. Uh, but the generalized uh, idea behind these imprecatory Psalms are very poignant. It's not just simply a trusting in the Lord to, uh, to make his enemies or to make their enemies to be ashamed. But it's very pointed. I want this. I am asking you for this as your follower to destroy the evil and wickedness. Oh man, that bell snuck up on me. The evil and wickedness of my enemies. Um, I don't know if we should start (laughs) down that path. I might let y'all out early this week because I really don't need to get into the next session uh, section with us without us having like 55 minutes to go through it afterwards. So, uh, any thoughts or questions on suffering psalms before we get into them? I really like what Mr. Jimmy said uh, concerning this change of of mindset between the Old and the New Testament. You know, the Old Testament, at least, uh, still the same God, still the same um, Creator of all things. Ultimately, uh, still the same uh, relationship to a point. Of course, once we get the Messiah born in the New Testament, things change a little bit. And then once the death of Jesus occurs, then things change quite a bit. Um, but, uh, but when it comes to uh, Jesus' teachings on these things, um, it, it's important that this, mind shift, uh, this mindset shifts within the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom is different. The kingdom is not like it used to be. The kingdom is not like those who followed after the old law. The kingdom is completely and totally different. And so uh, as part of that, their actions, their thoughts, their prayers, uh, their hearts need to be different. It's not eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It's turning the other cheek. 
It's not um, seeking after the worst of others or, or to harm others. It's praying for the betterment of those who seek to do evil or wickedness towards you. Um, and at times, it would probably be easier for us to have imprecatory style <laughs> prayers than prayers of forgiveness for our enemies. Um, it's hard for those who oppose you to bring you joy at times. And yet that is the thing that Jesus requests of us, that we find joy when they um, experience joy, that in their accomplishments that we can find joy. And that's not always easy. When someone makes you real mad, what's the last thing you typically want to see them do? Smile. <laughs> you want them to be upset too, don't you? And yet that's not the way of Jesus. Uh, that's not the way of the kingdom. Yeah, he sure did. <laughs> uh, Paul, I think, was a, a, a very good example of, of a, a New Testament imprecatory writing, I guess, if you will. Um, and yet I think it was something beautiful um, about Paul's um, expressions towards his enemies is that Paul often also wrote about, uh, and in his prayers especially, is that they might come to know the truth. And then he would go and teach them or teach those who seemingly opposed him, uh, which is even more difficult than finding joy <laughs> for those people to, to bring them uh, into, uh, into a relationship with the Father. But at the same time, what's the best solution for uh, division? Uh, I think the best solution for division would be to bring one to love and to know the truth, the one who brings forth ultimate unity. Uh, and we will pick up in... Um, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 uh, next week. Actually, no, not next week. Brother Irby will be here the next week.